Okay, uh, so uh, I've announced the date and what we're talking about. So the po you know, so you, the goes with the podcast. Um, so it's February seventh, and we are finishing up the uh, major themes of the course today, and then we'll start doing uh, the chapter on graphics after that, which will take us a couple sessions to get through that. Uh, I posted some suggested readings on the website under assignments. Uh, one of the, the main reading is just chapter two in uh, the main book for the course, um, but I also have a couple other chapters there that are that are quite nice, and they add some overlapping material, some different material. Um, so I encourage you to check those out, and um, and then we have a new assignment today that you'll do in lab. Um, okay, so we were here last time just talking about what is the problem with ignoring repeated measures on a unit uh, when doing estimation and inference. And for this particular problem, the bottom line was that on estimation was there wasn't much of a problem. You still had an estimate estimator that was unbiased. And we talked about what that meant last time. And then we went to inference. And when you do inference, that's just another estimator. It's an estimator now, not of the parameter itself, but of the variability of the estimate of it in repeated experiments of the kind you did. Um, so it's a slightly sort of an abstract concept, but it is the basis for statistical inference. And so we talked about naively assuming things are independent in that case, and we look at the estimator of the variance, and we find that it is, in fact, biased, that the expected value of the naive estimate in repeated experiments of this kind, that is, you do the sample variance, you divide by the total number of observations, and that is your estimate of the variance of the average is biased. Um, it's equal to this thing right here when the true one is equal to this thing right here. And so, and in this particular context, that is this particular model, you can see how the bias occurs in that um, it's underestimating it. So there is some intuition in that context where we'll see situations where it doesn't, this doesn't follow, but when I'm, if I'm estimating just a mean, typically the case is if I ignore repeated measures, I underestimate the variability, I'm treating the data like it has more information than it really does have. It doesn't really have capital in observations. It has somewhere between the number of people and the total number of observations. That's kind of the effective sample size. And that's an informal way to think about it. The formal way to think about it is just to derive what the variance is. Um, and um, now once you get this right here, there's, you can talk about how do I now estimate the variance of a sample average. That's not a huge challenge in this case, allowing for correlation. And of course, a lot of the course will be spent on uh, how the various models that we're going to look at do that. But anyway, we're not going to do that for now. This is just a graph of what happens um, as a function of this bias. So the, 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 um, this part right here, the y-axis, gives you what is the expected value of the estimated naive variance over the true variance as a function of how much between person over within person variance. I could, have, I could have done this different ways. I could have done it as a function of correlation or some other way, but I, I did it this way. As the between variance goes, as this thing goes higher, it means there's more and more between subject variance relative to within subject variance, which means there's more correlation of observations made on the same unit. People are more alike observations on the same person are more alike than observations on different people. And that's more true the farther you go that direction. In this case, one just means there's no difference. So naive is, it turns out in that case, naive will be, give you the same estimate of the variance as, I mean, in terms of expectation. So there's no bias because the ratio of the naive one to the true one is one. They're the same. And that makes sense because if you look at it, the between person variance here is zero. So if that's the case, there is no differences between subjects. The subjects are completely interchangeable. Like if you um, think of a, I, it's hard to imagine a circumstance that might be like that with people, but you, 
maybe, maybe some, for some kinds of outcomes, whether a person has a cold or not, there really is no difference in the rates of cold between people. And every observation you have on a subject is interchangeable with another subject, that it doesn't really, um, there isn't really subsets of the population that have higher rates of colds. I know it doesn't sound terribly plausible to me, but that's the example that came to my head. Um, so if that's the case, there is no correlation. If you look back at the, um, at the um, formula for the truth, it means this thing goes away. And of course, that just means you get this equal to that, right? So that's what you're seeing there. And that's intuitively kind of what you expect. That just means whether I take repeated measures, two measurements on M people, or just do a random draw of N measurements in a target population of measurements, outcomes on people, there's no difference in that case. Now, we don't typically um, expect that. We would never estimate it assuming that. We, the whole course is built on the premise that you want to be able to have your inference allow for correlation when it's plausible. And you want it to estimate. You don't want to just assume it's a certain correlation. You want the process to estimate it. So in fact, if they are independent, it will go to something that looks like this. And if they are not independent, it will reflect that in the inference. Anyway, the bottom line here is that, that as the between subject variance gets more and more, I eventually, you know, I'm under estimating the variance. This, type, this is like by 0.6. So a factor of 0.6 to, it, times the true variance, meaning my confidence intervals are way off. They're way too small. P-values are way too small. Um, and so that's example in this one simple model. Again, we're not going to always know what the model is. We, there are parts of the course where we will specify a model, just like we did here, that generates a certain correlation. And there's times in the course where we'll say, we're going to estimate the mean of y given x. We're going to predict the value of y given covariates. Or we're simply, we want to get an estimate of an association adjusted for risk other confounders. And we want to uh, make sure that if there's correlation, we account for it in a proper way in the inference. Um, because again, as I said, in many contexts, the estimate's not hurt by ignoring the correlation too much, or at all, in this case. This just gives a more tangible example. So just, I just did um, you know, one simulation from this, calculated the cor you know, the, using the correct standard error that takes account of the correlation and one where I was naive. And this is sort of the bottom line. You know, this is just in one simulation, one sample. That doesn't tell me necessarily that the um, correct one is better, but I know it's unbiased, so I know it will be better. Um, and it will be, on average, bigger than the naive one. How would I tell that, in fact, my 95% confidence interval, based on some estimate of the variance that takes account of the correlation, is doing a good job? Let's say I have the model. I can simulate from it. How do you evaluate a confidence interval? So you have a method of making a confidence interval, right? You make a standard error. Basically, you have your estimate. I'll just make it, uh, let me make it less abstract. Let's make it a coefficient in a regression. Oh, and actually, we'll just go with what we, the mu, mu hat. Plus or minus 1.96. And I calculate the standard error somehow. Now, I'm generating the data on my computer. This is you know, a 95% confidence interval. Wall, it's called a walled type confidence interval. It's a type you've probably seen if you've taken other stat courses. You assume the estimate is normal, and you add and subtract 1.96. So that is the 97.5th quantile of the standard normal distribution to the estimated standard error. And you come up with this random interval. And I want to know whether my process of getting this inference, where I know the model, and that process is called an estimator, is working. So how, what does that mean to be working for a confidence interval? How would you test it? You? you? <laughs> Exactly. That's exactly right. So you're looking to do the right thing. 
That's precisely what you do. You run whatever estimator it is. That's a formula that takes the data. It's an algorithm and takes the data that I get, and it produces a standard error. And it also produces the mean estimate. I construct my confidence interval, and I look and see, does it contain the true value? And I do that 100, 1,000 times. And I count the proportion of times it contains the truth. And a 95% confidence interval is supposed to contain the truth 95% of the time. It's a random interval that has this property. It's, a, again, kind of an abstract concept, confidence interval. Um, I mean, we use it to give us sort of a feeling for how much we really know about this particular parameter. But that's its formal definition. It's a random interval that has the property that in repeat experiments of this kind that you just did, it will contain the true value. And that's how you test it. That's how our biostat students will test an estimator and inference and make sure it's actually working OK. Oops. OK, so that's one of the, I mean, I consider that sort of a nuisance of longitudinal data. And if my goal is to get the mean of y given x or the mean, um, however, uh, as we'll, we'll see when we start getting into things like mixed models, we might be interested in the correlation. We might be interested in the variance contributed by different levels of units in our target population. It could be simply people versus measurements within people. And it could be other units like um, a, hot, a study I'm dealing with now, which has villages and then subjects and or villages, households, subjects, and, ran, and measurements of subjects over time. So it has four different levels. And I might want to know how much does village contribute to the particular outcome. In this case, is uh, diarrhea. Or I might ask, is it, is, it, is it the village level? Is it the house level? Are villages really different? Are houses different within villages? Are people different within households, which would imply something completely different? So we'll learn methods to estimate these variances even before we start associating things with covariates. And they'll give you some sense of where to look, what's important in, in this particular setting. These, this one of these settings is in Ecuador, and one of these is in Bangladesh. And they are sort of the, in some ways, the real virtues of having this sort of hierarchical structure, which comes from longitudinal data, um, is that one can start breaking down where the variability is coming from. All the variability is coming from villages, and I'm studying infectious disease. I really expect there's something about the village. Everybody's getting contaminated water in one versus another one where they're not. Um, I, you know, rare, you rarely see that actually being the outcome. But if that was, you'd know you start looking at village level differences. If it was individual level differences, you might suspect maybe it's related to age. Uh, you know, some young children are touching the dirt and older children are not. And then, or it could be related to Im immunity factors, things like that. Income, you know, it could be socioeconomic stuff. So, um, although that might be household level. Anyway, you can see how this game works. So it's a very useful thing. For now, I've just treated it as a nuisance, but later we'll come back to it and treat it as a virtue. Um, but what is an obvious virtue of longitudinal data is the fact that you have longitudinal data. You have a history of what the person experienced. You know, Typically, if I take a cross-sectional sample, I can try to reconstruct that. Right? I could construct longitudinal data from a cross-sectional sample. It's often done like a retrospective cohort or something like that. I forget how these names attach to the particular study designs. But anyway, something to that effect where I could say, you know, here I can see right now, I can measure some outcome on you. And then I can ask your, you know, whether or not you have a particular disease, for instance, and a test. And then I can go back your history. What was the history of sexual activity you had? What is the, um, what is your history of, um, of, um, education, all these other factors that you might think contribute to your outcome. And I can construct longitudinal data, right? So I mean, the reason longitudinal data is preferred in that context when I really just want to know the disease at one time point and look at the history is, we, is not so much the statistical aspects of it. It's the reliability of the information, right? From our standpoint, um, and I'm tr trying to treat this as how I would use that data and its virtues, it's just the, and its structure mainly, it's just the same as if I had 
collected it prospectively. But so the real virtue of longitudinal data prospectively relative to that is really the how reliably how reliable the measurements are because you're asking people at that time and they can remember or you're measuring it and not relying on recall, all those other kinds of things, which are merits of, of these kinds of studies, which are really you know, somewhat not this course. This course is more about the technical aspects of estimating things once you have it. But there are still important things about um, relative study designs, which I'm sure many of you have discussed in, for instance, case control versus cohort studies. Um, but given that, as it may be, how it's collected, I now have a history. And I don't have just a snapshot anymore. And I can try to construct how is it about a history of a subject that differs, not just what they look like right now? And of course, that is a lot more information and can find things that are much more subtle to find than if I simply measure everything at once on a subject and what's happening to them today, what's their height, their weight today, what are they, what happened to them the last week, all those types of things that are characteristics of uh, cross-sectional studies. So that's all well good. It means that you also, though, have to put in the regression um, how these things come in over time. In other words, you have to parameterize your model so it incorporates things like how the subject changed in their covariates over time. It doesn't just follow that I collect longitudinal data and I do a regression, then I'm going to get answers that use longitudinal data. So part of this course is how do you look how do you use the data set in a model, which really means making a variable uh, that addresses the specific question you have that is constructed of history in a way, um, where the interpretation of, say, the coefficient on it is an inter interpretation that's related to longitudinal changes. That just doesn't come by putting in the data and doing a regression. That will give you just cross-sectional effects, but ones at different times. That's not the same as a longitudinal effect. And so um, here's one example, one example that you can look at, because we have the data, and we will use it in this course, um, is that we have this recruitment, and, re and recruitment over time of subjects in a study of HIV and AIDS. And recruitment can play sort of nasty tricks on you, because there can be what are called cohort effects, that people you recruit at different times might have different levels of things and might have different characteristics as well. So it might have different CD4 counts. It might have other things related to CD4 counts. But those are just sort of two processes that are independent. They're just going along together. And as you recruit them at different chronologic times, you can get the appearance of an association when it has nothing to do with one causing the other. It's just two secular trends that change with time, right? And so what you really want to see is within a subject, if they change, is there and I can see that change, let's say viral load, for instance, am I more likely to see a change in CD4 count as opposed to I'm looking at your viral load today and looking at your CD4 count today and comparing people with low C viral loads versus high viral loads, for instance. That I don't really know. That could be a cohort effect. It could be all, all kinds of things. But if I can see the change happen in time and I can parameterize my model so it captures that change, then I'm more certain that I have a cause and effect. That's really the virtue of longitudinal data. Um, this is just an example of how you can get these effects. And we'll just see, we'll see pictorial examples in a sec. You can come up with different scenarios where you can get this cross-sectional effect that you might see be different from the longitudinal effect. And if you only have a cross-sectional study, you can't distinct, can't tease them apart. You just assume, you'll have to assume that the cross-sectional is the longitudinal. So here's one example. Um, there was um, an earlier in the year, uh, there was a um, decline in CD4 count with time since diagnosis. That happened early, obviously, in the history of HIV. That was uh, pretty much, for, for, for most people, what happened when there was an effective antiretroviral treatments. Um, if subjects recruit were only measured once since their CD4 count and recorded the times of diagnosis, a bias can result. Why? How does that bias happen? Well, subjects that live longer will tend to have higher CD4 counts, for one. There's a selection process that happens. That often happens in, very, in diseases or, or when studying things like, like death, as you can get selection because 
if you're recruiting, you're more likely to recruit somebody, you're only going to recruit someone that's alive, and they're all, more likely to be alive if they have a certain relationship. So you're going to find a relationship that's dictated more so, that may be dictated entirely by the selection of, of subjects that comes from this process that those that decline quicker die quicker and don't make it into your sampling. And um, I was actually talked yesterday in the staff department uh, about this, but it's a general issue. Um, so if I collect it one time, I'm not be able to, I can't really distinguish that out. And I may not see the relationships between viral load and CD4 count um, because I'm really just seeing a process by which the sorting occurs in a population and, and I take a sample. And because of uh, the natural differences between people and the relationship between CD4 and death, at the end I'm going to get a relationship which may not reflect the true underlying one. That is, I define that to be how does it change within a person how does a change in something affect a change in something else? Here's just an example. So these would just be trajectories that I might have of CD4 levels since time of infection. And for whatever reason, as I'm, this is a chronologic time going this way right here. And I'm recruiting people at this, you know, this could be whatever, 19. 89, I'm just making this up, right? 1994, so you have some idea. And I'm plotting, you know, the people, I take repeated measurements on subjects, and I'm looking at them, and I'm interested in this particular pattern here. How do they change over time? Let's say it's quite simple in their CD4 counts. If I just had cross-sectional data, that is, I just measured that person once, and I got both the time since infection and their particular CD4 count, for instance, I would have the data just at the ends of these things, right? I would just have these data. I wouldn't have the other arrows. And if I did a regression of those, I would get like something that would look like a flat line. And that I wouldn't see the fact that almost everyone in here has a decline over time because those recruited later, right, tended probably to start up here. They started up here and came down to this point. So those that were recruited later lived longer, and therefore they probably started with, let's say, with high, higher CD4 count, as indexed at some, some particular time. It's completely hypothetical in this case. But it's the type of um, uh, bias that you can get. Uh, that's outlined in a couple of those chapters I put uh, for uh, chapter one, uh, in addition to our chapter. Um, and um, it's also why if I measured each subject twice, I would be able to distinguish that because I'd be able to look at their change in time and I could average those changes in time across all the people. Every person I can get their beginning CD4 count, their end CD4 count, see the amount of time that elapsed, get a simple e estimate of the change per unit time and average those. That's a perfectly fine thing to do and that I would get an unbiased estimate. I'm not doing anything fancy. I just have two measurements, so I can look at the change in one versus the change in the other. However, if I only get one measurement per each individual, I can only do a regression of time since infection first that, versus that first measurement. And that may be incredibly misleading because of these effects that people may, who start high may live longer than people who start low. Or other ones you can think of. This is one that's in um, one of the... Um, one of a common uh, kind of course textbook if you're taking this as a, uh, as a stat student in, in, um, and you were going to take a repeated measures course, there's this book by Diggle, and this just shows a different way. This is what it looks like in, if, I, if I don't either know or I don't use the information that I have repeated measures on this subject, I simply get a scatter of reading ability over age. And of course, if I did a regression, it would look like that. If I use that information in some way, and in this case it's just simply plot, connecting the dots among those where there are duplicate measurements on each subject, I in fact see that reading ability increases with age. That's one scenario. Another scenario is that in fact it decreases with age, but in this case it's more, the decrease is bigger uh, than would be implied by the cross-sectional effect. This is called the cross-sectional effect right here. Now that's called cross-sectional. 
And these individual little lines are the longitudinal effects. So not really rocket science, not really that complicated, but it's amazing when you look at the analysis of longitudinal data how many times people do not use the fact that instead of having a, their current value versus their current outcome, they have a history. They can say, well, what was the change, and how does that predict the change in my outcome? And, it, and you have to construct your models, as we'll see, in a way that will do that. I'll give one example, but you could do it in many different ways. This is where really how you parameterize it, how you put that, make that variable, you know, you're going to get columns of observations where every, at every time point you're just going to get the measurements made at that time point. It's not, the data you get from whoever is creating the data set is not going to know how you want to use it. You have to go in there and you have to construct variables that might relate to change of, uh, for instance, um, a viral load from the current time to the first time the person came in. You have to create these variables as part of the unfortunate data processing that has to go into longitudinal data in order to use it in a way where you're capturing its virtues. It doesn't come that way from the, you know, it doesn't come that way from the uh, person doing the data processing. It's just going to give you a data set where it has rows of data in an Excel spreadsheet. So this is where you have to think about the question you're asking and then how do you construct the variable that in a regression will answer that question. And that's, I'm giving you an example of how to do it but there are more than one, more than one way to skin a cat. It's a terrible saying, anyway, although my cat. Okay, so let's look at, this is one way, which is, a, which is sort of the standard way that you'll see in many textbooks, and this very simple way. So I, again, what's this thing right here? That's, I have a regression model, so what I'm, I'm I'm assuming that I've collected data, longitudinal data on a subject, and I have, you know, I have a, I have an ID here. Let me just make a, yeah, I'll just do it here. I have a I, I, I have a J, you know, and I have an X, and I have a Y. So it'd be like one, 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 and then one, two, three, and then these are just numbers. XIJ, I guess, that go with that. That's what my data set looks like. So for the first row is the first measurement on the first subject, and I get their X and I get their Y. So in this case, I can, I'm looking at a regression. I can, I can just put in the current value, so I could just have a model that, you know, that didn't have this part in it. I could just put in one that had, um, that uh, just has the current value, and that will give me um, the so-called cross-sectional effect. But if I want to distinguish these two types of effects, ones where the baseline, the, essentially that the starting value changes with the cohort versus the change within, so the starting value here is changing this way, while the initial value is changing that way. If I want to distinguish those two, then I have to parameterize in the way it does that, and this is one way to do that. You have one, you put in a variable which is just the first value. So you carry, if I'm constructing that data set again, that means I'm carrying the first observation on, let's make this um, tangible. Let's say Y is CD4 count and X is viral load, which you'll have in your data set. So I carry down the viral load that was measured at time one on the subject, all the way down. It's just a creating a new variable it's the same value for every time, but it's their first viral load measurement. And then I create a second variable, which is the change from that one. So it's the change from the current value, viral load to the baseline one, change since baseline. And if I do that regression, I have these two coefficients, and they represent different things. Remember, the process of parametric regression like this is that you put in covariates in a way, so hopefully either the coefficients or simple functions of them have some interpretation with regard to the question you're answering. And in this case, that very well be, may well be true. So how do I get what beta L is? Well, I have to change this by one, right? Keeping that fixed. If I want to get the change in Y, given a change in the Xij minus Xi1 by one, keeping Xi1 fixed, that's going to be the longitudinal effect. It says for all people that started 
at the same value of viral load, what is the change in CD4 given that change in viral load? And in this case, there's no interaction between that original value, so I'm assuming that's the same for every subject. That's embedded in the model. It's not true, necessarily. Probably certainly not true, but it's just what the model is imposing. So in order, that's what beta L uh, technically means. It's the change in Y, in the mean of Y, for a change in the change, keeping the baseline value fixed. And that's equivalent to that little, the slope of that, those lines. That's one way to do it. Now you could do it other ways, right? You could do this in different ways. I could do it versus the change. Maybe I think the most important thing to get at is the change since, oops, is the change since not the first time, but the last time. We have x i j minus entire history of viral load. You can do to answer that question of how the history and it's often used. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to this point many times, particularly when you're doing your projects, because one, one of the biggest common mistakes made in these final projects, although less so over the years because I'm emphasizing it more, is that people do a great job getting the data set and defining these technical issues with regard to correlation. You have to, you know, don't, can't ignore it. And they do a regression, and they do it just like they have cross-sectional data. There's nothing about the data longitudinal aspect that's used. It's just repeated measures on a subject. So it's like repeated cross-sectional analyses. So you know, the, how you use it in some way is a function of your scientific question. And that may, there may be some art there. It's hard for me to teach that every possible way you might use the history. Um, so you have to rely on your, uh, on your judgment. And I'm giving you a couple examples of ways to do it. But it, I'm not telling you this is the only way. You have to know what your question is. Um, and you have to parameterize your model such, such that it answers your question. That's really one of the hard challenges of being a statistical analyst, is you want the model to answer the question. And so um, this is one way of answering one question. Again, it makes fairly large assumptions about the model. Um, but as I said, uh, that's the nature of a course that teaches parametric regression. That even if you don't believe the model, you might think of this as some approximation of the average change across subjects. Let's say there's interaction, and you don't put it in the model. That, in fact, that change is a function of where you start. If I start at very high viral loads, then the change in the mean of CD4 count for a change in viral load may not be very much, as if I get down to very low viral loads, or, or vice versa. I'm not sure which one. Uh, um, but one of those may be the case and I don't actually allow my model to do that, then it's kind of going to give me something like the average change in CD4 for a change in viral load, um, even though there isn't really one number that describes my population. The model's false. How do you get um, the interpretation of this? Again, you know, this is an exercise you've done a, a little bit in lab and we've talked about. It. I'm not going to do it right here, but it's an algebraic exercise. I want to know what the interpretation uh, beta C is, well, how do I compare two means and I just get beta C alone at the right? What, what two means do I compare? Well, I'm going to say it right there, obviously. I, if I take the mean of Y um, when I change two populations by their, two groups of people by their initial, um, let's say, viral load, their initial measurement of X um, at time one. That means at time one, this thing is zero equals 0 at uh, uh, j equals 1. Because xi1 is equal to xi1, right? So that's 0. I know that goes to 0 if I just keep it fixed at time 1. So it's the change in the mean of y for a change of people at different initial levels at time 1. That's the definition of beta c. And so that gives you that cross-sectional effect, essentially how we go back here. how people are different, in this case, by age, as you change their initial value as you change age. I'm not saying the cross-sectional effect isn't always interesting. The cross-sectional effect could be interesting in itself. It's just different from the longitudinal effect. 
and it always should be tested um, uh, because you really want to distinguish between things. If you're, I mean, if, if it's relevant, if you're recruiting everybody at the same time and they're all the same age and you're following them forward, there is no of these facts. They can't ex exist, right? You've taken them out because you don't have the possibility of selection bias anymore. Anytime you're doing ongoing recruiting and there is the process possibility that something might be changing in the population, so their initial values will change as a result. Um, then, um, you know, of their outcome, for instance, then um, you uh, then you really want to distinguish these uh, two different things. So it's just more likely your model will be true if you don't assume that the cross-sectional is equal to longitudinal. As I said, in, in some cases, if I was doing a, a clinical trial and doing longitudinal study on a group of people, and baseline was always when they started their treatment or placebo, this becomes not an issue anymore. There's just not. I, there is. Um, uh, there is no bias from the cross-sectional effect. There is no cross-sectional effect. Anyway, in that same model I just showed you, if I only have cross-sectional data, but I'm interested in the longitudinal effect, and this is often done, if you read papers that have cross-sectional studies, and they're really interested not in how changes between people, like changes between people in viral load affect changes between people in CD4 count, they're really interested in in a more clinical kind of question, what happens if it happens within an individual, they will treat the cross-sectional effect as an estimate of the longitudinal effect when they're writing up the, the paper. I mean, that's when it comes in. It's your interpretation of it. And that will be true in this particular model if that happens to be true. <laughs> so it's true, in fact, if they're equal, if both of those are the same. Again, that's a miracle. So in cases where you can't guarantee it's true, it should never be assumed. Another way to think about this, um, so it's the same process. I have these baseline measurements of subjects on something like viral load. And I'm interested in the impact of some other viral load on a CD4 count is that um, this thing here is serves as a confounder. That any kind of uh, confounding of viral load at, t at this time in its relationship with CD4 count can be blocked by the initial viral load. Nothing is a better proxy for everything that might confound it than the measurement itself. And so this is another way of motivating that model I just fit. You simply, if I'm looking at the association of the current value and the um, and the current the current value here and the current value there and I want to know the true effect and how they change it with an individual I need to adjust for a confounder and this is a really good confounder uh, that's another way to think about it that the history itself is a good confounder and, the, and you know the history itself could include the outcome the outcome measured earlier can be an excellent confounder to try to block all other confounders yeah Could be, yeah, definitely could be. That's a very good point. It could be the entire, I could make this the entire history up to that point. So you can do this in various ways. And I'm just, I'm just doing it consistent with the drawing. But yeah, I think you would try to figure out what set. I mean, in a perfect world, you would put the entire history in. You'd let the, some model selection procedure do a good job. And uh, if you're in a world where you're not estimating these parametric models, so you're using them to estimate a param so maybe a particular kind of causal parameter, then you wouldn't have to rely on fitting a model that had coefficients that made sense, and you could do machine learning or something. But in our world, in this class, we're, 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 we're doing what's traditionally done, and that is how do we get an association of this and that in a parametric model with a coefficient adjusting for the proper confounders. And this just gives you this box could be a lot of different things, but the idea is that hi history gives you an excellent outcome right here. If I put yi j minus 1, that's really good. Is there anything that could possibly have a pathway to yij and this that didn't go through, let's say, you know, yij minus 1? 
And the idea is that I put this dotted line here. There's some unmeasured things. And the hope is they all go through that might affect the outcome. And they all have to go through. There's no, this pathway doesn't exist. If this pathway exists, then I, I still have unmeasured compounding. I mean, this is really an obvious, uh, when people do things like when, when they're um, looking at paired observations of somebody uh, before and after an event, they're really trying to basically take a care of the confounding that they can't measure because they get an outcome before the event, the event occurs, they get a good outcome after the event, and they assume all the other things that I wish they could have measured that might confound what happens because of the event are controlled for by what I knew about the subject's outcome before, whether that's CD4 count or BMI or whatever it is. So that's also something to remember. If you're trying to get the current impact of something on the outcome and want to make sure you're adjusting confounding, you have a longitudinal study and you're measuring outcomes repeatedly, think of the outcome as a pretty, or, or the previous values of the covariates of interest as really good potential confounders to adjust for that. So that's another way of using it. This, this diagram right here would just sort of justify the models I did previously as well, right? It would, that's all this is, is I'm model where this is my variable of interest and that's my confounder. So this is my you know, variable of interest, of interest, and that's my confounder. Spelled wrong, but anyway, because someone raised their hand. Yeah. It actually doesn't matter. Just algebraically, if I write this out, this is equal to beta L xij minus beta L times xij, right? So that means I can rewrite this as beta C minus beta L xi1 plus beta L xij. We'll see this in some of the later. Uh, when we start actually doing regression models, I'll, I'll just play around with this. Those, wh when, I, when I do this, it turns out that th these numbers will turn out to be different depending whether I put in the change versus just the current value. But the model fits identically because those are interchangeable. I can just, I can take this one and add, subtract that from that to get the coefficient in the other model that it would, would they fit identically. So this because it, it, you kind of get more directly at the interpretation, but in fact, it's just the same as if I just adjusted for the, I just had xij here. This would be a different number, if it has a different interpretation, but the model fits identically. That's a good question. <laughs> so really, that's why when you come back to it, down to it, what longitudinal data. And really, I mean, that again is just, a, it's kind of a formal way of, of capturing intuition. If I have longitudinal data, I'm watching, as opposed to a snapshot, the whole movie. And so I, na I know what came before. So I know if this particular thing might have caused CD4 count outside of viral load, because I'm watching the progression, as opposed to I just get something at a time point. Well, what that means more formally is that I'm able to adjust for confounding because I have the entire history. And that history can be an excellent confounder, particularly when it's related to the covariates of interest and to the outcome. In fact, that's when a confounder is. So particularly is a dumb thing to say, that is a confounder. All right, so I'm just making this point here. I gave you one kind of way of parameterizing a model. And as I said before, it's going to, in many ways, um, it, this is more of an it's going to be, I wouldn't say an art, it's more of a, it's still a science, but it's related to your question of interest and how you think the confounding occurs and what you're trying to get at with your longitudinal study. Um, you know, I, and so um, I have this general model right here, written here, which is this given, let's say, you know, some covariate xij, maybe that's what I'm interested in, and I have the entire history I could adjust for, everything all the confounders, all the variables of interest, all the, all the outcomes. So I mean, this is essentially what you have the possibility of regression. This is, you know, you might think of this as a pure prediction problem. I want to give the best prediction of the current value given everything I know about the 
patient in the past. And of course, this will evolve. As I move along, I know more of these things. That creates a real technical challenge for how to do that in the regression, but it's certainly possible. And of course, you can also imagine it creates a challenge with regard to data processing, because that means for every row I go down, I'm going to have to be creating an entire different history. So this is where data processing and longitudinal data can be kind of a nightmare, because it means you're, you're going through different rows and trying to summarize them, but bring those values up to different, you know, to a, a particular row. That's always hard. It's easy to do things across rows, as you know, in like Stata. You can just add numbers and divide them or whatever. But when you're doing things, so within a row, it's easy. When you're doing things across rows, you have to summarize them and put them back on a particular row. That's a little harder. That takes a little bit more skill. Um, we'll have simple examples in, in the graphics chapter and other chapters, but um, in general, there are gen, there's not, I, you know, you can't teach every possible trick you'd have to do um, to process data to get it. Stata has a lot of nice built-in things to like sum, like do the cumulative sum of this or, or carry this value forward. They have a lot of built-in things that handle uh, longitudinal data, which is nice, um, but they don't, can't obviously handle every situation. Now, the last thing just has to do with, bless you, has to do with efficiency, which is that ignore all about trying to distinguish the longitudinal and the cross-sectional effect or, or that. I just might just have more measurements on a subject. I think the simplest case to think of is I just have a treatment and I have a placebo and, I'm, and, I, and I just was working on a study where they were looking at, uh, it was a trial of uh, gabapentin or something like that. It's like a diabetes medicine or arthritis? I should know this since I worked on it, but I, I don't remember. <laughs> it's one of these things. And pain is the outcome. I know that for sure. So pain is the outcome. Um, what is it? Oh, maybe that was what it, yeah. So it was, neuro, it was neuropathy kind of thing. So it must have been for diabetic patients suffering from neuropathy. Thank you. That's what it was. Now I remember. Um, <laughs> So anyway, they had, uh, they had repeated measurements on the subject of their pain score. And so, and you know, you could, at any particular time a patient takes one of these questionnaires and you get a, um, you know, they have these instruments they develop to sort of capture pain. It might just be that there's variation in week to week that's sort of random. After a certain point, the drug is kicked in or not. And we'll assume there's no trend in the effect of gabapentin over time. It turns out that's not true, but let's assume that's the case. Then the more measurements I get, the more I'm able to average out for each subject that noise, that variation, because these things are very subjective, the pain scores. And so particularly on their mood in the morning, they may feel high in one day and feel high, feel, <laughs> Freudian slip, feel um, good on one day or feel bad the next day. And more measurements I take, the more I get a more refined measurement of their particular outcome. So in this case, I get a more efficient, that is an estimate of their particular kind of characteristic pain that's better than if I just took one measurement because I'm averaging out here all the noise that might. That's just a question about efficiency that you can gain, and that's an example of one. That's fairly obvious in situations where any particular measurement can be quite noisy. And I do work a lot in the world of, or at least in the past, um, the uh, diarrheal research, and that's incredibly variable. I mean, it's just on one, it's, it's very variable um, over the year, and it's highly variable within a subject. And so if you take one measurement of whether they, not, they have diarrhea in a particular week, it almost gives you hardly any information about are they in general sicker or not. You need lots of uh, repeated measurements over time to sort of characterize that individual. Anyway, this is the basic recaps of the lessons, and one we'll go over with um, again and again when we bring up specific topics on how to model longitudinal data is that one is naive analysis okay? Do you even have to take this course? Well, in some circumstances, and for estimation, yes, it's not still it's not biased. You have repeated experiments of the type you did. The estimator ignoring correlation will give you something that the mean is equal to the truth. So. Um, that doesn't mean it's necessarily the best one. You might be able to get more efficiency by uh, having repeated measures, but or not ignoring the repeated measures. But um, at least you know it's un, 
bias. And for inference, generally, almost always the answer is no. Uh, it's not OK. And, um, and that's, you know, in some ways, interesting. It's good to know. It m motivates procedures like mixed models and GE in many cases, but it's not that interesting. So this, in some ways, is the more interesting part. Um, and that is, you have now the ability to ask a lot more different kinds of questions and in many cases get rid of confounding that you couldn't get rid of in a cross-sectional study. So it gives you um, more authority to make causal inferences when you can look at change over time in one thing and see how it predicts what happens in the future. And of course you can get the increased efficiency as well. Okay. Any questions about that? These really are, you know, we'll have other things we talk about the course, um, but these are sort of the big themes to go back to as we uh, hit different topics, including the graphics topic, because we'll talk about how to graph data to incorporate or try to bring out longitudinal change. Okay, I'm going to just start this. I have to end a little bit early today, so I'm going to just give an introduction to this lecture. We're going to spend a few lectures talking about graphical display of longitudinal, day, uh, longitudinal data. And uh, really, some of it's just kind of practical tools to learn in Stata, because longitudinal data is a mess often, and you want to be able to sort it in a way where you can get plots that just aren't a pile of lines and points on it. Page. Some of it, though, is more substantive. Is how do you, for some of the questions I just posed and some of the models I just posed, you can explore them with graphical data if you do it right. I can look at how changes in one thing change, predict changes in another. And then we can talk a little bit about some other, beginning to talk about some other more pattern finding things that are interesting that we may get to at the end of the term. Like if I have of patterns over time, like CD4 over count over time, can I characterize my set of patterns into a subset of very similar types? Can I sort of create archetypes of uh, the, the patterns, sometimes called trajectory analysis and things like that? So we'll look at a very simple example of how to do that um, in chapter two. And we may come back to more formal ways of doing it um, at the end of the term, but um, that's also I, that's a particular interest of mine are sort of pattern finding algorithms that can search out um, search out without specifying anything about what it looks like. Can I simplify a big pile of data, a bunch of trajectories over time into characteristic subsets that may tell me something about the type of people I have. I've used this in um, studies of cortisol with children, sort of look at are there how do children react to stressors when you measure cortisol after giving them some scary movie or whatever they do in those little rooms when they torment the poor children and they measure their cortisol and then they have different patterns and they have different patterns during the day and that can sort of tell you, oh, there's kids that are hyperreactive. They really react quick. You know, their cortisols jump up. There's kids that sort of have the normal pattern. There's kids that just don't react at all. Um, and so you can start to separate out the maybe types that can help you explore how they're different. And so we'll look at that. That's, I'm, I'm interested in that. As I say, it's a little bit, little bit off topic, but I think it's useful um, for many of these kind of longitudinal things where you have basic questions about the type of people that might exist in your data set. I'll just start by going over some of the history. Longitudinal data uh, graphics have a fairly long history. People started to realize you could graph things. It's amazing that the invention of the x-axis was a huge thing. So it, it actually wasn't made by the, this particular person, um, but used data where the person had just reported the numbers by year. So this all comes from, uh, I have the article, or will have the article on these. This comes from some dictate by Henry VIII after the plagues which said every parish 
um, had to record the annual, I think, deaths, but also christenings um, uh, every year. And so I had, had to keep these things called bills, so uh, keep a record of what happened to the population. And it was motivated by, um, there was one or two bubonic plagues during that show, The Tudors, that's all I know. But during The Tudors, there, I know there was at least one plague. And so it was during that time, and so this is looking back at the data and constructing the number of, of christenings over time. Um, and uh, the person that just recorded this table and tried to explain, it was actually, I don't actually understand this part. It wasn't, hasn't been written about very clearly, but it was done to prove the existence of God. I don't, <laughs> to me, I don't look at that, and I mean, I don't think it proves God doesn't exist, but I'm not sure exactly what they're getting at. But it also shows how graphical data, just very simple things like this, just plotting the numbers per time can start to bring out uh, events and also bring out problems with the data, which is sort of crucial for uh, often for us. If we look at plotting the data out, if we just look at numbers, it doesn't always jump out of us. You plot it out, you start to see, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. And that actually occurs here. So if you look at this, there's various plague outbreaks where the number of births go down, which I assume is related to the number of christenings. And then there was this very bad uh, civil war, very bad period of time until Charles the something first was killed. And the civil war ended, and it took a long time for people to get back in the swing of things. And then there was this enormous fire. This is in London, so this is not over all of the realm, but just in London. And um, there was a big fire, and that, of course, um, it's amazing how these events just affect, you know, people. I mean, we've seen, you can see this even in things like 9-11, that they have a uh, measurable impact on things like birth rates and, uh, and related things just doing with overall stress in the population. And of course, these stressors were just ginormous. And then they recovered back, and then they keep on going up, and then all of a sudden, you get this drop, a huge drop in 1704, and there's no known event in 1704. So is there any, can you look at that thing and kind of get an idea about what happened? Or some of you may, if you already know what happened because you've read this before, don't say. But can you look at that plot and say, I might know what happened. Remember, these are people, this is a person taking down the data and just writing down the numbers in a column, right? This isn't, there's no Excel spreadsheet back then. So they're writing down numbers in a column that they add up. Do you see something there that might have caused um, that big dip. That's too hard. I wouldn't have never seen it myself. Did somebody want to make a? You have to yell. Oh, okay. No problem. What was that? Oh, you're thinking like a public health person, <laughs> which is good. That's what you're supposed to do, <laughs> unless you're not in public health. Oh, you are? Okay. You think about a person that, um, that's always just looking for trivial mistakes. <laughs> well, you can't see it because it's a, that number is exactly that number. Oh, which I just drew on the... Uh... <laughs> okay, you guys did not see that. Okay. <laughs> It, this, it's not a pin, it's a stylus. So anyway, the, these are the exact same number. I mean, to the, they're in the thousands and it's to the digit. So the person simply copied down the wrong. <laughs> That's all it was. It's just a, it's a writing, just a, it's a copying error. Anyway, I, I love this plot because there's so much going on. And of course, you just see so much about how historical events affect the health of the population as measured by the number of births at this time. I'm sure there's other ways to measure it, of course. So um, that's a fabulous thing. Well, my opinion. OK, here's one that just looks at the um, longevity of famous people. So this is a very, very old plot trying to look at whether there was changes in um, the amount of time people lived from the time of Solomon. Um, and I don't know how the heck they know how long Solomon lived. I don't know if it's gotten from the Bible or not. And then all the way up to uh, Augustus Caesar, who lived a ripe old, 
Now, he may or may not have died a natural death. None of these people like die natural deaths. They're all stabbed or beheaded. But um, <laughs> that's 70. Yeah, he, he, I don't know, you guys probably are, are too young to have watched um, I, Claudius. But, you know, in I, Claudius, Augustus poisoned by his wife? I think so. And I think there was rumors that's the case. But anyway, this is a nice plot and shows the longevity of people. Of course, if you see plots of this that cover the span of, of people and aren't done, are, are based more on um, scientific records. I mean, there's this, it's really actually hard to figure out longevity in the past. Um, you see sort of dramatic differences in how longevity changes, obviously, and particularly it all changes in the late 1800s, but I like this plot. And it's one of the early examples of trying to see something by just simply plotting the data on a horizontal axis. It may be one of the first times people used a horizontal axis. That other plot I showed you, that per, the person that recorded the data didn't do it. He failed to do it and, and so forth and didn't really see the patterns. But here's one where there was an attempt to try to uh, examine patterns over time. This one is so boring, but it cracks me up because it's, it's so Thomas Jefferson, if you know anything about Thomas Jefferson. Even been to his house in Charlottesville. He's a kook. The kooky guy, and he does all kinds of weird little things on the side. And this is where he just plotted the vegetables that were available by month in Charlotte's. No, this is Washington, D.C. So, Washington, D.C. And anyway, you would really, and of course, this wasn't a time where they were shipping uh, raspberries from Chile, so you really got what was uh, locally available. You know, I guess what were, were the, this was the local food movement before its time by necessity, and um, you can see it would be a terrible time to eat in uh, December unless you liked, well, you got potatoes, and you got them almost all year. You got turnips and cabbage and parsley and lettuce. So um, anyway, this is, I thought this was great because it sort of tells you what eating local might mean for not living in Berkeley, where eating local is so fabulous. <laughs> and I'm all for it. Don't get me wrong. Okay, I'm going to stop here actually today because I, I, I have a meeting I have to go to. So we'll continue with this um, next time. And I'll give some examples in Stata. <laughs>